Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Eric Turing. I'm the Senior Vice President for the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine, and I would like to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine and its partner organizations, the National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians, the U.S. Animal Health Association, the American Association of Food Safety and Public Health Veterinarians, and the National Association of Federal Veterinarians. I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Gabby Eddings, graduated from Washington State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Animal Science in 2011. She continued her education on the Palouse, earning the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from Washington State University College of Veterinary Medicine in 2015. Dr. Eddings joined USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service after earning her DVM as a supervisory public health veterinarian. After a completion of a veterinary pathways internship with the agency. Following her years as a supervisory public health veterinarian, mm -hmm. Dr. Edding served as the frontline supervisor for the Boise, Idaho circuit until 2020, when she assumed her role with OFO regulatory operations as a veterinary medical officer in Washington, D.C. In her veterinary medical officer role, she served as a liaison to APHIS Veterinary Services and technical subject matter expert on various projects and work groups. She obtained her board certification in veterinary preventive medicine in 2022 and is currently a diplomate of the ACBPM. Dr. Eddings is currently the district manager of the Alameda District Office in Office of Field Operations for USDA FSIS, a role she assumed in January of this year. Please welcome Dr. Gabby Eddings. Hi, Dr. Toring. Thanks, everyone. Uh, can you still hear me okay? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. So um, thank you for that. So today we are going to speak about uh, food defense and the responsibilities of regulatory authorities and regulated industries. Of course, um, since I'm speaking um, within my role of FSIS, we're going to focus on FSIS and, and their role. But I think you can really take these um, um processes and, and knowledge and uh, understand kind of how it affects all industries in, in terms of food defense. So I'm going to turn off my camera just to save some bandwidth and hopefully avoid some issues. Okay. Okay, so again, so as indicated uh, this afternoon, I'll be speaking about the concept of food defense and those responsibilities of regulated authorities along with the regulated industries. Uh, again, we're going to focus on uh, the role of FSIS um, and therefore the meat and poultry and processed egg product industry, um, as those are the commodities that are regulated by FSIS under the Federal Meat Inspection Act, um, the PPIA or Poultry Products Inspection Act, and then the Egg Products Inspection Act or EPIA. So the food system in the United States continues to increase in complexity, diversity, and reliance upon interconnected domestic and global systems. Concurrently, the threat landscape and potential sources of intentional adulteration continue to evolve and increase in complexity, which would ultimately have a powerful impact on public health and the economy. There's a responsibility for the global food supply chain and is shared across all levels of government, uh, that be it foreign and domestic, and through collaborative public-private partnerships and industry, uh, and working with industry. Developing comprehensive risk management systems, including food defense plans, to protect the food supply establishes a foundation for minimizing these potential public health and economic impacts and therefore ultimately promotes food security and resilience uh, of the food supply. So industries, including veterinarians, uh, have an impact on the food production chain along this farm to fork continuum, right? This is, this is a concept that is brought up um, more in, in more ways than, than we can count at, at this stage, I would say. So food safety, food security, and food defense intersects in numerous ways at various steps throughout this food production chain um, through the processes such as production, processing, distribution, consumption, and disposal. So every step along this food supply chain requires human and or natural resources, which could be potentially uh, 
potentially intentionally or unintentionally um, sources of contamination or adulteration. So food actually moves, as we know, sy um, systematically in a domino-like motion from producers to consumers along this farm-to-fork continuum. And because the food supply chain moves in this domino-like fashion, when one part of the food supply chain is affected, the whole food supply chain is affected um, because all of this is interrelated. So I wanted to kind of set the, the groundwork here. So before we, we dive in deeper, um, what is food defense? So it, it might be a concept that you've heard before, or it might be something um, you're really not that familiar with. So to ensure that we're all using the same definition as, as we move forward, I, I wanted to define some of these public health concepts and we're not confusing food defense with, with other things. So for this, food defense is mitigation strategies that protect food products, including meat, poultry, processed egg products, from the intentional contamination or adulteration. And that intentional act is intended to either cause harm to public health or economic disruption. The management systems in place for food security do ultimately promote food security, but food defense is something very specific. So again, so as I said, it, it promotes food security. So, so what's food security? So to better understand the intersection of the public health concepts and to provide additional context between the various concepts or systems you might be familiar with. Here's a couple that, that I'm going to help further define. So food security is, is again, not food defense. As I mentioned earlier, food security can be promoted by food defense strategies along with food safety strategies. So food defense can be defined by a, an excerpt here from FAO that you see on the slide. Food security exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food, meeting dietary needs and food preferences for an active, healthy life. So as you note on this slide, so there's four recognized dimensions of food security, and those include availability, access, utilization, and stability. And so these dimensions make up what food security is. And then we come to food safety, right? So food safety, which for FSIS, uh, and especially uh, one of my major roles here is, is public, it is food safety. As a public health regulatory agency, this is what our primary focus is. Food safety, however, differs from food defense because for food safety, those are strategies to protect against unintentional contamination or illness versus intentional. So again, the key difference if you go back to the, the slide defining food defense, that's the protection of against intentional. And so the key difference is this unintentional versus un, or intentional. But you can tell how they all kind of, um, how they're all interconnected and they all play together to ultimately promote food security. So again, the three of these public health concepts defined earlier they're all interconnected. So to protect or to prevent, protect against, mitigate, respond to, and then ultimately recover from, if there is an incident, um, from threats or hazards of greatest risk to the food supply, it's important that preparedness efforts do encompass food security or food safety, food defense, and then ultimately food security as a goal. So while there are distinct differences between these three concepts, a comprehensive approach that addresses food safety, food defense, and food security considerations improves the resilience and protects public health. FSIS inspection personnel conduct food safety and food defense verification tasks in all regulated establishments to identify potential vulnerabilities that may lead to intentional contamination of product. Food safety, again, focuses on the protection of food products from unintentional adulteration, while, again, food defense focuses on protection of intentional adulteration. So just wanting to reemphasize uh, that main difference. So just so you kind of understand the, um, the scope of, of FSIS as a regulatory agency, um, while 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 we dive into food defense. So as a public health regulatory agency, FSIS has approximately 8,700 total personnel with approximately 7,600 of those personnel working on the front lines. Um, 
in what we have now uh, approximately 1,600 federally regulated um, inspected establishments, which are across the uh, United States and its territories. One important note, and you can see it uh, pretty small here on the slide, I don't know how easy you guys can see it, over 95% of the slaughter and processing establishments that are all regulated by FSIS are considered um, either small, small meaning that they have fewer than 500 employees or what we consider very small, and they're considered very small if they have fewer than 10 employees or do less than two and a half million a year in sales. So you can tell that the greatest number of the establishments regulated by FSIS fall under these, this small or very small, with a very, very small percentage being those very large or large establishments that uh, many people might think of and you might think of their names off the top of your head just sitting here today. So, and I've included this next slide. Here's our um, inspection numbers for FSIS in, in FY23 or fiscal year 23. Um, remember, for most of us do, do recognize this, the federal fiscal year is from October 1st to September 30th. Um, but I believe this slide really does assist in demonstrating the impact the role a regulatory agency has to promote food safety and food defense for the purposes of, of this presentation. So during fiscal year 23, FSIS implant personnel ensured public health, um, health requirements were met in meat, poultry, processed egg product establishments that slaughtered or processed 161 million head of livestock. And that includes uh, cattle, swine, um, your small ruminants, um, 9.8 billion uh, poultry products or poultry carcasses, and then 2.7 billion pounds of liquid, frozen, and dried egg products. So FSIS, um, within this fiscal year 23, um, implant personnel conducted 7.7 7 million food safety procedures, including procedures that are focused on food defense. Uh, these are all to ensure all federally inspected uh, facilities continue to meet the food safety and wholesomeness requirements uh, per, per the regulations that we operate under. So food defense, again, is a priority for FSIS. FSIS promotes and encourages regulated industry to adopt um, functional food defense plans. In addition uh, to our field operations staff that conducts the food defense inspection task, we do actually have a staff dedicated to preparedness and response, which uh, does uh, encompass food defense. So um, this staff is SIPRS. Uh, they stand for the Sig um, Significant Incident Preparedness and Response Staff, quite, quite the mouthful. Um, and they actually work with other government agencies, industry, other organizations to um, help develop and implement strategies that um, are ultimately can be put in place to prevent, protect against, mitigate, respond to, um, and or recover from intentional contamination of the food supply. So again, since 2006, FSIS has seen a continued positive trend in the voluntary adoption of um, um, functional food defense plans. It's important to note today that um, the adoption and implementation of a functional food defense plan by regulated by the regulated industry that, that FSIS oversees is voluntary and it is not a regulatory requirement. So this is uh, this is an important difference between uh, our food safety uh, regulatory requirements. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, FSIS as an agency, we've continued to see a positive trend in industry adoption of functional food defense plans. Remember that 95% approximately, of the slaughter and processing establishments regulated by FSIS are considered uh, small or very small. Um, and so uh, if you look at this slide here, as of April 2024, um, uh, based on the FSIS task completion data, it indicates that an overall 86% um, of regulated industry um, per the completion of this task has, has uh, implemented a, a food defense plan. If you look closer at this data, you will notice that the, the large establishments within the industry, they're implementing these food defense plans at, a, at the highest rate. Um, the, the, 
significant majority at 97% of these large establishments have a functional food defense plan that's implemented. Uh, and then if you go to the small establishments, you have 91%. So still a very high um, percentage of those small establishments that are regulated by FSIS in, in the 90s. I, I would say that's a very good rate for voluntary adoption, right? This is, this is voluntary. Um, whereas you can see um, the very small plants, that's, that's where we have the lower percentage of implementation of these functional food defense plants. So, um, and of course, uh, just, just in terms of uh, averaging out, it, it kind of gives you that overall of 86%. Okay, so what is the food defense test? I think I mentioned it on a couple slides, and, and that's the data that I that I showed you previously of how we know how many people are uh, implementing a functional food defense plan. So every quarter, uh, we conduct one routine. Um, all that means is at a regular frequency, we're conducting what we call a food defense task. And again, that's once per quarter. The task is assigned per establishment and actually consists of the inspector reviewing implementation of food defense plans if an establishment has one. They'll discuss findings with the establishment uh, management if there's any findings. Um, they'll complete and document this task in uh, the Public Health Information System or PHIS if, you, if anyone's familiar. And this is uh, our data analytics system that, that we have in the agency. So uh, during this task, um, FSIS conducts um, basically a, a questionnaire um, and, and we respond to this questionnaire uh, based on uh, the strategies implemented by the establishment if, if they have a, a plan. So this questionnaire contains approximately 20 questions. I didn't list all of them uh, uh, in this presentation. So I captured um, six of them here on this slide. These are just examples of what's included on the questionnaire that our inspectors actually complete when they're doing their tasks, as I said. As you can tell by the questions, they are based on the management practices to mitigate the risk of the possible intentional contamination or adulteration. And you'll note some themes here, um, just by the six here that I, that I pulled out of that questionnaire. So uh, themes such as uh, practices specifically for personnel, um, access to the facility. Sometimes those are, those are questions that come about. Um, chemicals used in the facility uh, and storage of product and material are, are, some, are some themes within the questionnaire. Okay, so based on that, the questionnaires for fiscal year 23, I just wanted to show um, some of those most frequently implemented strategies that establishments have and those that were uh, of the least frequently implemented defense strategies. It doesn't mean they aren't implemented, it just means overall there's some of the lower implemented strategies compared to, to other um, areas in which an establishment can implement strategies to, to mitigate risk. Um, so for the most part, those that are more frequently implemented, you'll kind of notice they primarily focus on access to the facility um, by either product, maybe that they're bringing in, materials that they're bringing in, or personnel um, and personnel who have access or visitors that might have access. Whereas those that are less frequently implemented, those really um, lean more towards like training and giving awareness to the entire workforce at the facility. So those are just some general themes in which uh, you can see between the most frequently and least frequently implemented. So as mentioned earlier, we do have a staff dedicated to the um, to preparedness and response. And, and again, that's SIPPERS. And their primary functions include they're the staff that's going to be conducting uh, overall kind of vulnerability assessments for the industry that we regulate. Uh, they'll be collaborating with federal and state, local, tribal, and territorial governments, industry, and academic partners to promote food defense and the adoption of food defense plans. Um, Developing and sharing guidance for developing and maintaining food defense practices, including uh, these functional food defense plans that we're speaking about. Identifying and implementing countermeasures and mitigation strategies. 
conducting analysis of food defense surveillance data, maintaining close relationships with intelligence and law enforcement communities to educate collectors and analysts of food defense uh, to better inform their work and enhance uh, the exchange of information. Also working with the scientific community on food defense research initiatives, uh, integrated uh, project teams, and risk assessment work groups. So they're really doing a lot of work um, as a whole of, of different strategies and, and different things they need to be abreast of that's affecting the industry as a whole um, for our agency. So I think this slide uh, nicely depicts maybe what some potential sources are and, and what those impacts could be. So to reiterate the importance of this, uh, this figure I think does illustrate that. And uh, you can see in the red here, um, some potential sources, and that could include disgruntled employees, uh, foreign domestic extremists. So for example, like uh, a group such as this could be the source of intentional contamination, such as uh, chemical or bacterium being intentionally introduced into say a lot of product. Um, or um, as an example, think of a foreign material being introduced, um, anything such as that. And if this were intentional contamination, it could result in public health impacts that are identified here uh, in silver. And as it hits those, you know, uh, the impact could, uh, they, they just build upon each other, right, is, is the thought here. And depending on what the, um, the intentional source of that contamination is, chemical, bacterium, foreign material, depending on what that is, it could have various impacts. It could have psychological impacts to consumers, adverse economic impacts, loss of confidence by consumers in the safety of their food purchase. Uh, they can bring about widespread public fear. And, and again, it depends on the act. Um, and it could potentially have catastrophic public health consequence. So um, just a real world example uh, of intentional adulteration in uh, in 1984, in the Dalles in, in Oregon, it's a, it's a small town in the Dalles um, along the Columbia River, um, there was an outbreak of salmonellosis, and actually it, it was caused by intentional contamination of uh, restaurant salad bars. And this was done by members of an extremist domestic group, um, if I recall correctly, uh, you know, it was a group that that was doing it to hopefully not allow like citizens within it, within that area to vote because they wanted to, uh, you know, influence an election. Um, so these things have been happening. You know, this was a 1984 example. So this isn't something new um, in that um, in that incident. Uh, you know, it's reported that uh, 70, 751 persons um were confirmed with uh, gastro um, gastroenteritis caused by salmonella, um, and they were associated with either eating or working at these area restaurants where the where this uh, group uh, contaminated uh, the salad bars. Um, Forty five of those individuals were were hospitalized. So this is just an example of um, you know agroterrorism, bioterrorism by a domestic extremist group, um, you know, at, at a salad bar. So what are food defense vulnerabilities? So a vulnerability can be any part of the food production or storage system where a protective measure should be implemented to protect a product from intentional adulteration, such as uh, a measure is found to be missing or, or not in place. So if you're looking at the process, if you don't have something in place, do you need to put one there? If you don't have one there, it's probably a vulnerability. So food defense vulnerabilities, again, are weaknesses within the food production process that could make it easy for intentional contamination of product. So an establishment can put food defense practices or mitigation strategies into place to reduce the likelihood that intentional contamination will occur. This should be considered when IPP conduct their food defense activities. Um, so a comprehensive list of some mitigation strategies for various components uh, of the food supply, those can be found on our website. Uh, we provide uh, a tool publicly called the Food Defense Risk uh, Mitigation Tool. And again, that's that's on our website. Uh, you can think of this a lot like um, for identifying vulnerabilities. Think of it like establishments performing a hazard analysis for food safety. Um, 
So, right, you conduct a hazard analysis, you determine steps along the process that you uh, may need a, a CCP or critical control point to be implemented to mitigate an identified food safety hazard. So kind of a, a very similar concept, but you're just um, looking at, at different types of hazards. So again, going back to vulnerability assessments, yes, an establishment will conduct vulnerability assessments specific to their establishment, but FSIS does also conduct uh, vulnerability assessments uh, at, you know, for industry as a whole, for the industry we uh, regulate. Um, and so this is, um, this we base these assessments on a, a national security memo 16, um, and this is actually a federal government uh, plan for, for all agencies um, that are uh, involved in this, along with their partners, to continue the collaboration on ensuring the nation's food and agricultural sectors uh, is secure and resilient uh, against domestic and global threats. So, so this is an important um, responsibility for, for many agencies uh, per this uh, National Security Memo 16 that we're operating under. So this brings us to discussing in more detail the role of industry. So, you know, the title of this presentation is not only the responsibility of the regulated uh, authority, but what about the regulated industry? And so there are benefits uh, to the regulated industry to adopt functional food defense plan. And these benefits include uh, numerous ones that you can see here on the slide, but you know, primarily they're benefits for public health and economic stability. And uh, you can go through these bullets here. And again, we, we strongly encourage as an agency for industry to implement uh, functional food defense plans um, you know, for the benefit of, of public health and you know, their own economic stability along with uh, our nation's economic stability and public health of consumers. So a key component to protecting the food supply is again, the development of this food, these food defense plans. The plan provides an opportunity to identify areas where food security measures could be enhanced. And then once they're implemented, the plan will help focus employee training, response and recovery actions. So for industry, so food defense plans uh, should address key areas within their establishment um, think of personnel and mail handling security, inside outside security, uh, security for their slaughter and processing, uh, shipping, receiving, storage security, and then water and ice security. Um, as you can imagine, the, the food industry uses a significant uh, amount of uh, water um, and sometimes ice, depending on the production system. So these are all uh, key areas that uh, they should be focusing on. Um, as they look through their, their establishments process. So what's actually a functional food defense plan? So you can have a food defense plan, but is it functional? So a functional food defense plan is a tool that regulated industry can use to prevent, protect against, mitigate, respond to, and recover from an incident uh, of intentional contamination. For a food defense plan to be functional, the plan must meet all the following. It must be developed, it must be implemented, it must be tested, and then it must be reviewed regularly for maintenance. So, uh, and as an agency, FSIS, we do have resources that are available to assist regulated industry to develop these uh, functional food defense plans. So you could see there's, there's opportunities for establishments to develop and implement, but for it to really be functional they need to continue through with these, these second two uh, bullets here, this tested and then reviewed for maintenance, right? At least annually or when revisions are needed, say uh, there was an incident uh, that they were identified or they identified a new vulnerability, then it would need to be reviewed, right? Uh, and that would be the as needed. So this is kind of the crux of that, really making it functional based on experience. Many can develop them, many can implement certain practices, but uh, you know, it's it's really the follow through of these additional steps that are very important. So 
These three steps here on this slide, again, are important for establishments to develop and then implement a functional food defense plan. So the establishment would need to conduct a food defense assessment. That's really those vulnerability assessments, but specific to their establishment. Um, and they do this um, by identifying steps within their process. And then once they do that, they have to develop a written plan. And then, right, you have to implement that written plan. So then they would be implementing that written food defense plan. And then again, once they implement that plan, for that plan to be considered functional, they would need to test that plan by monitoring and validating it, um, potentially performing mock uh, food defense drills, almost what you think of with a, you know, a mock recall. Um, and then they'd be regularly reviewing this plan. So it's not just creating it and sitting it there and kind of just having it. It's really um, reviewing it, monitoring it, making sure it's still functional and consistently reviewing that over time. So establishments, again, would perform the following uh, for the management of their written food defense plan. Uh, they, would, they would designate a team um, and those team members would uh, have identified responsibilities. Uh, the establishment would conduct trainings. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they would conduct mock food defense drills. They'd maintain uh, procedures securely, right? It's a food defense plan. You don't just want everyone at the establishment to know every detail of your food defense plan. So that needs to be secure. Um, in the plan, they should be including uh, emergency contact information, and they should have written uh, SOPs, standard operating procedures, to respond to threats and incidents. Uh, so these, these are all important. So establishments would also have to ensure the following. And so this is just a continuation of, of how they're managing, how they would end up managing a, a food defense plan. So... They would have procedures that ensure adulterated or potentially harmful products are not distributed in commerce. So they'd have a way to identify if, if an incident occurred, right? They have procedures in place for safe handling and disposal of contaminated products. They encourage employees to report signs of possible product contamination. Um, they promote employees and encourage them to report unknown or suspicious persons in the facility or breaks within that food uh, defense system that see something, say something. Um, they would include evacuation procedures in their plan. They would have procedures in place that restrict access, access, apologies, to their facility to only authorize personnel during an emergency. They would have documented uh, a documented recall plan in place that ensures segregation and proper disposition of recall products. And this is this goes hand in hand with our our, our regulatory requirements, but it's um, you know it it's uh, it goes here as well because it, it's important uh, because it could have implications on both sides. So recall plan is is both important for food safety and for food defense. And then again, they update the plan regularly, or at least assess, um, assess it regularly and review it regularly. So I think I've mentioned it a, a few times earlier. Um, FSIS, we do have numerous resources available for regulated industry to help them develop these functional food defense plans. And again, we're always encouraging them to adopt um, food defense plans. Again, it's voluntary, but it's it's a it's a strong it's a high priority for FSIS, and we really are uh, and do promote food defense plans being implemented. This one um, cool thing to note: we, we do have many of these resources, and they're actually available in multiple multiple languages to assist um, many different. Um, establishment managements, owners, uh, et cetera, for, uh, you know, their needs uh, to be able to assist them with the with the resources they need to, to create a functional food defense plan. So here's some um, national issuances that are significant to food defense. I highlighted the National Security uh, Memorandum 16 
earlier uh, in the discussion, um, speaking at, about uh, the vulnerability assessments uh, that that SIPRS um, conducts. But here's some others listed, and I think it's just important to note that this isn't just something that that FSIS is doing. This is um, this is a national priority, and there are uh, issuances uh, out that uh, agencies are operating under. So. The 120-day um, food and agricultural interim risk review issuance, so that provides a review of critical and emergent risks to U.S. food and agricultural sector, um, as well as ways to mitigate those risks. Um, no, next, you'll note in 2011, there's a presidential policy directive uh, on national preparedness. And this established a policy aimed at strengthening the security and resilience of the uh, U.S. through uh, systematic preparation for threats that pose the greatest risk to the security of the nation. And it includes active terrorism, cyber attacks, pandemics, and catastrophic natural disasters. Um, and then there's another uh, presidential policy directive and this one's on critical infrastructure and security resilience. And in this one, um, it established a national policy on critical infrastructure, security, and resilience, and refines and clarifies the critical infrastructure-related functions, roles, and responsibilities across the federal government. And um, also um, enhances overall coordination and collaboration amongst those. And then there was an executive order in 2013, and it called for the development of a cybersecurity uh, framework uh, to increase the level of core capabilities for critical infrastructure to manage cybersecurity risks by focusing on information sharing, privacy, and adoption of cybersecurity practices. So you can see there's there's numerous issuances uh, at the national level to, to promote um, preparedness in this space uh, in food defense, uh, amongst other things, but but food defense is part of this is because all of these, you know, are a potential could lead to a potential risk. Okay, and then so for more information, um, if you guys are, are interested, um, or would like to learn more. So FSIS, we do have a, a small plant help desk. And so this is a, a great resource for establishments. We call it small plant help desk, but you know, any, any uh, member of industry could, could use this. Um, we also have, you know, the 1-800 number. And then if if anyone has specific food defense questions, uh, you know, there there is this email here to reach out to our food defense assessment staff. Uh, and this would go to that staff within SIPRS uh, to be able to, uh, to assist with any specific food defense questions. Okay, and with that, um, a little early, but um, leaving enough time for questions, hopefully. I would like to go ahead and start questions. Um, uh, we've got a couple of them. I am going to try something. Um, Dr. Pam Abney asks a question. And I'm going to uh, activate her microphone, Dr. Ab Abney, um, if you would like to ask your question of Dr. Eddings. Well, hey, hey there. Uh, I, I may have missed it, but um, are food defense plans still voluntary but encouraged for the very small plants? Yes, uh, great question. Uh, yes, they're still strongly encouraged. Um, uh, the agency as a whole, uh, it, it is still not a regulatory requirement. This is still um, on voluntary adoption. Um, so including for very small. Yeah, you know, and, and just to get back to that, I know when I when I was with the agency back in, oh my gosh, well, when the food defense plan suggestion first came out, it's been 10 or 15 years now, I guess. For a long, well, since 9-11. And they kept saying it's going to be mandatory, 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 but I guess not so. Not so. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, um, you know, we've seen we've seen phenomenal success with the with the voluntary adoption approach. Um so you can see from the statistics, um, yeah, the, the very small, I think it was 79% of the very small establishments. Um, and these are functional food defense plans. So this doesn't mean that you know, the industry 
as a whole aren't implementing any mitigation strategies. This is, you know, based on is it meeting all those definitions, right, that, that we consider functional, whereas uh, the large industry is uh, 97% and then the small is at 91. So at this time, uh, yes, it, it's still just um, voluntary. Yeah. And if I could be allowed, um, I, I know that, that the noncompliance records used to be written in certain situations for certain violations in food defense. Uh, is that still the case? It would really, um, I would say it's not common practice based on my experience. It That would have to be in conjunction with um, some other regulatory noncompliance that that plays a role in. So it it kind of be uh, in addition with the with the regulatory finding, but uh, memorandums of interview are another type of um, documentation that you may remember from your time with the in or agency. Uh, that type of documentation would be would be there. Okay, because because there used to be actual coded food defense tasks that were up to be done. So in the course of doing a food defense task, if you found, you know the back door open to the da-da-da, this and that and the other at midnight. Um, <clears throat> so I guess the task, they've dropped the task from the... Oh, the, the task's still there, but uh, I think it's important to remember just for everyone on the call. So if it's if it's non-regulatory, uh, non-compliance, a uh, non-compliance is related to a regulation, right? And so to be non-compliant, it would, it would need to be regulatory. So there's still a task, um, and so there can still be documentation within that task. It's just, um, it's semantics in, in some ways. So it'd still be documented, but in a different way. So uh, not a non-compliance record, but in a, in a memorandum of, of interview, so an MOI. Fantastic, thank you very much. You're welcome. Great, um, our next question, um, an anonymous attendee, so I will just read uh, the question. How is FSI is planning to enforce food defense plans for very small facilities? So again, I think going back to the, the last answer, so it really is adoption uh, or encouraging voluntary adoption. Uh, we encourage them consistently when we're meeting with these establishments, when we're performing the task every quarter. So just because an establishment doesn't have a plan doesn't mean we don't do the task. So it still allows us that time to encourage and promote those. Um, even if they're maybe unable to do a functional food defense plan at the time, but can they implement strategies? So it's that type of encouragement that we're doing uh, with all plants, but of course, in particular, very small plants. All right, great. Um, I am going to activate the microphone for Dr. Mo Salman. Um, and he has a question. Let me get to that. Dr. Salman? Hello, uh, I'm sorry, I was on, 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 I was on mute. Do you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, we can I hear can, you. I can, yes. <laughs> okay, well, I, I wrote the question and uh, mainly to make it clear, but I will kind of read it for you. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, uh, particularly and emphasizing on the link and the differences between the three terms, the food defense, food security, and food safety. I wonder if you could elaborate on the relationship between the FSIS in food defense and the other relevant agencies along the food supply chain, such as APHIS and FDA. I am aware, like, as you said, which is that I give credit to the FSIS. You do have like a section about food defense, but I don't know if they FDA and APHIS have the same thing and how you coordinate with them in that respect. And additionally, and this is only a recommendation and suggestion, uh, are you aware of the protocols and the documents for food defense in the UK that could serve as a model for similar protocol by the uh, NATO uh, that's being produced that way. And I sincerely encourage you to review this protocol for this topic. Over. 
Thank you. Um, okay, so for your first question in terms of like relationship between FDA and APHIS and kind of where they fall or, or our interactions with them. So um, for FDA, I'm not aware of their systems specifically, but to my understanding, they do have um, also, I would say, um, aspects of their system that that include food defense for the uh, industries that are regulated by FDA. FDA regulates right a wide array of, of food production industry, but uh, to my understanding, they do have um, concepts of food defense within their, their framework. Um, I just couldn't speak to them specifically um, since I haven't worked on them specifically. Um, however, um, with our staff sippers um, at headquarter level, they would be the staff that's interacting with these other agencies regularly in these types of incidences. Um, FDA or other sister agencies within USDA like APHIS. Um, I think it's important to note that, that food defense, why we're working on these work groups or when we're interacting with APHIS at the field level, for example, or even FDA at the field level, we might not call out food defense specifically, but we are always interacting on potential hazards that are affecting the food supply. So it, it might not be that we're calling out food defense specifically, but we are interacting for different threats or, or different things that, that might come up that might end up being, being an issue um, or even a one health issue. So, so that's important. Um, I am not your second um, suggestion. I think that's a great suggestion. I have great interest in that. So I'll have to look that up because I am not personally aware of the protocols they have in the UK, but but I'm sure those in SIPPERS are, but I appreciate that suggestion. Yeah, I think for my personal interest, I will, I will definitely look that up. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> wonderful. There's, there's one more question. Um, in addition to guidance, does FSIS have examples of strong written food defense plans that can be provided? Uh, one of our um, attendees provided a link in the chat session, um, and those are uh, uh, guidelines of, of written defense plans. Uh, do you have any other comments on that topic? No, I, I would say the same. Um, on our FSIS website, we do have links to um, to the guidelines that that provide them uh, a framework for for how to write a functional food defense plan. And again, uh, we also have uh, some of like the risks um, and vulnerabilities that that are common within, um, and then mitigation tools that they could implement. And Sippers uh, has developed those, and those are on our website too. So they can use those in conjunction with uh, the guidelines. If our guidelines might not have enough specifics for them, so. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, I do not have any additional questions uh, from our attendees. Um, I definitely want to thank you, Dr. Eddings, for a very informative presentation on, on food defense plans. Um, and uh, once again, we, we cannot do this for our uh, uh, ACVPM diplomates and partner organizations uh, without volunteers such as, as Dr. Eddings. So if you're interested in a uh, giving a presentation, <clears throat> or have a suggestion of someone that would make a great speaker for one of our ACVPM webinars, um, you know, please contact us. You can email me at admin at acvpm.org, or you can go to the ACVPM website and look under our continuing education tab. And there's a uh, little bit about our CE webinars and how to uh, propose a, a presentation. But it's volunteers like Dr. Eddings that, that make this uh, uh, program a success, and we highly encourage folks to, to participate so we can keep doing this thing. Um, you're getting a lot of hand claps. Hopefully, you can see those on your Zoom screen. Uh, you got to go Cougs in the in the in the uh, webinar chat. Uh, so uh, well done, Dr. Eddings, and, and we greatly appreciate it. Uh, one okay, more. Thank you so much. One more shameless plug: um, the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. Uh, the application uh, period for 
our 2025 board certification examination uh, is now open. So if you're interested in potentially becoming an ACBPM diplomate, uh, if you're not already a diplomate, uh, please look into that. Uh, you can find more information on our website, uh, acbpm.org. So with that, I will close out today's session. Once again, thank you, Dr. Eddings. Thank you for all the attendees. Uh, keep an eye out in the next few days for our uh, announcement for the August webinar. I believe it's on August 22nd, but don't hold me to that. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And I thank you for everybody for attending. Everybody have a wonderful afternoon or evening, wherever you may be in the world. Thank you.